Well, hello again, everybody, to our brothers and sisters at um, East Lake Church. I'm really glad to be able to serve you in this way, and I hope this is a help as uh, we seek to worship God together. I'm going to start by uh, reading from Isaiah chapter 12. If you've got a Bible with you, you might want to turn to Isaiah um, just to read along with these words. What's going on so far in the prophecy is Isaiah has um, predicted or foretold God's destruction of both Israel and Judah, uh, God's act of judgment. He's going to use the nation of Assyria uh, to sweep judgment across both um, parts of Israel. And yet, as part of that judgment and that foretelling of the judgment, Isaiah also uh, tells the Jews that God is going to protect a remnant of his people and that they will enjoy God's blessing and provision and protection throughout the judgment that's coming. And not only that, that, that God will keep this remnant, but also God's salvation will one day spread throughout the entire world. All sorts of Gentile nations will be brought in to receive this blessing and provision and protection from God. And as he has foretold those things and, and given little hints about how that might happen, and the, the one, the root of David, the root of Jesse, uh, who is going to be the means of bringing that salvation. He then, in chapter 12, gives us uh, the hymn that God's people in that day will sing. Uh, and that's what we're going to pick up today in our reading. Isaiah chapter 12. In that day, so that is the day when uh, it, uh, the remnant from Israel and the nations around are all brought back together to enjoy this salvation of God. In that day, you will say... I will praise you, O Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away, and you have comforted me. Surely, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord, is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day, you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, Make known among the nations what he has done and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Well, that remnant of Israel and uh, the number of Jews, uh, the number of Gentiles who are brought in to share that salvation. Uh, is not limited to a few in the Middle East. It has now spread across the whole world, and we rejoice that we are part of those people enjoying the salvation of God. And so these words that Isaiah writes are directly our words. We are those who, at one time, God was angry with, but now have received God's salvation. We are the ones who can sing with joy. We are the ones who shout aloud to, to the nations around us to tell them of the goodness of God. And that's what we intend to do in our time of worship this morning. Well, let's do that by singing our first hymn together, Come, O Fount of Every Blessing. Oh, 
praise, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to live, the God I love. Take my heart, O oh, take and seal it, seal it from thy courts above. Well, I'm going to lead us on to uh, our main reading for today. Uh, the reading is taken from John chapter 6. Um, this is uh, the set of words that we'll be considering as part of the sermon later on. John chapter 6. And I'll begin reading at verse 24. Once the crowd realized that Jesus, neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent. So they asked him, What miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven. It is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. We will leave the reading there. I'm going to lead us in prayer now, if you'd uh, be willing to join me in prayer. Uh, I'm going to pray for a few things. Uh, First, I'm going to pray for for you over at East Leak and the situation that you're in. Pray for the church there and uh, God's ongoing protection and provision for you. Uh, I'll also spend time praying for Shepshed Church. I'm sure you're probably aware um, that Shepshed Church is... um, undergoing a building project at the minute they're trying to uh, get some funds together to to put up a new uh, building that will be more suited um, to the church and for their outreach in the town centre there in Shepshed. Uh, So we see this as really um, an investment for the sake of the gospel, uh, preparing and equipping the church for uh, many years to come 
Uh, so we'll pray for God's blessing on that project and God's guidance for Shepshed Church as they go through the various steps that it, that it takes to, to get that building finished uh, and in use. And then I want to lead us in prayer for um, some of the, uh, well, one of the nations of the world. Um, at this point, really, there are many, many nations that need desperate prayer. Um, of course, the coronavirus situation, we know how in the UK it has affected our economy. But since our economy is reasonably strong compared to economies of the, of the rest of the world, uh, then we expect that probably we will be able to bounce back with a reasonable level of success. Uh, but compare that to other countries of the world where perhaps the, the economy is not as strong, or perhaps also where there are other issues making things more complex, um, issues of uh, war or corruption. And you can see that for those countries, the, the recovery from the last few months will not be as straightforward and perhaps not as successful. Um, now, you, you could put uh, any number of countries uh, into this bracket, uh, from South America, uh, countries in Africa, countries in East Asia, uh, countries in the Middle East, um, countries in Eastern Europe, but we've got to pick one, and I want to pray for Iraq this morning. Uh, not just praying for Iraq as uh, the leaders of Iraq and Iraq as a country, but also particularly remembering our brothers and sisters, the Christians, the churches that are struggling through those situations in Iraq. So let's pray together for these things. Our Lord God, Heavenly Father, we come before you and we begin with praise and thankfulness. Our testimony, we praise you, is the same as that that, that Isaiah foretold. We can say that though you were once angry with us, your anger has turned away. And instead of being the angry judge who, who looks down on us with displeasure, you have become our father. You have become our comfort. You have become our salvation. You're a place of rest and joy. You've given us hope and you have given us reason to rejoice and sing and worship you. And we thank you for the way you've done this. It's not a slight thing that you've done. It's not simply a, a forgetting or a turning away. It's, it's a costly act that you have done in order to um, restore us to yourself. You've committed yourself to us in ways which are far greater than we ever could have hoped or imagined. You sent your own son to die for us, to become sin on our behalf, in order that we might be counted as righteous, obedient, pure and holy. And we praise you for these truths. Thank you that you don't leave us alone either, but you've sent your spirit to live in the hearts of each one of us, that you are present even with us in, in some sense this morning. We don't gather physically in a building, in a place like we once used to. But we know that by your spirit, you are present with each one of us, encouraging us, teaching us, opening our eyes to see and understand wonderful things from your word. And so we thank you that you've uh, blessed us in this way. We thank you that your grace has not been restricted to that small remnant from Israel. It's not been restricted to, to the Middle East, but it has spread throughout history, across the whole of the globe. And there is perhaps not a nation on earth that cannot count one of your people amongst their members. We thank you that it's spread to us, and we thank you that you've also given us the task, the, the privilege of being your ambassadors to the world. With that in mind, I would pray for the church at East Leek. Thank you for that church, that fellowship of believers, Thank you that you've placed them there, that you've given them this task of being witnesses and ambassadors for you. Father, I would pray for your ongoing protection and provision for that church. Protect them spiritually. Protect them from the attacks of the devil. Protect them from uh, discouragement or burnout uh, or, or any other thing that might lead them away from trust in Jesus Christ. Protect them from falling back into, into salvation by works, into trying to earn merit with you. 
but remind them constantly of your goodness and your grace found in the gospel. Father, I pray for their unity. Although they're small in number, uh, perhaps smaller than they would like to be and smaller than they have been, Father, they can still enjoy a great unity together, a great love for one another, a great unity of purpose as they strive together to share your good gospel with the, the town, the village in which they live. And so I pray that you'd bless them with that unity and protect them from disunity. And Father, I pray that you'd make them fruitful. Fruitful in terms of their outreach, that the people that they're reaching through the, the evangelists that they support, through the, the material that gets pushed through the doors, through just the very uh, witness of uh, living next to people and, uh, and being Christians in their workplaces and, and in the community. Father, I pray that, that would be a means by which people are brought to know Jesus Christ. I pray the church would be fruitful in bringing people to Jesus, in seeing people converted. But that's not the only way we look for fruitfulness. We want to see fruitfulness in the lives of your people as well. That they would grow in faith, that they would become more obedient disciples. That they would grow in their joy of, in service of you. That they would grow in their knowledge of your will. Knowing how to apply your word to the various situations in their lives. Father, I pray that you would protect and provide for your people in Eastleigh. We would also pray for Shepshed and we thank you as well for, for them and, and the, uh, the church family that you've put in that town. Uh, thank you um, that you've put it on their hearts to, uh, to set about making a firm, uh, stable um, building for, for the gospel work to continue in for many years to come. Father, we see this really as an investment for the sake of the gospel, allowing the church ministry to continue um, giving it an appropriate place, a, a welcoming place where people can be brought to, uh, a useful place so that a church can keep meeting. Father, we ask that you would uh, bless that building project, that it wouldn't be a distraction from the church for what they're intending to be doing. They, they're still a witness for you. They're still preaching the word. They're still being faithful week by week. Uh, even as this project goes on. And we pray that the, the project wouldn't be a distraction from your people, uh, from these things, um, but that it would, once it was finished, help equip uh, those tasks that the church is involved with. We pray that the building will be used for gospel outreach, that many people over the years would come to know Christ as they come into that building and hear the preaching of your word or are taught from your word and, and sit and pray with other believers. And as they see the lives of, of believers lived out in a very real way, in that town. And Father, I would um, lead us in prayer for uh, the country of Iraq. Uh, Father, the situation there seems so difficult to comprehend when we sit here in, in the safety and the comfort of our own homes. Their economy is collapsing. People have not been paid in months. Uh, the any, any sources of income uh, being quickly cut off. As a result, there is all sorts of political unrest. ISIS are on the rise. Other countries are uh, breaking in to try and uh, take control of the situation, but perhaps in an unhelpful manner at times. There is war breaking out there. Bombs are dropping. Guns are firing. Crops, fields, buildings are being burnt, razed to the ground. Father, we ask that you would protect your people, especially uh, through this unrest. Keep the church safe. Protect their Christian freedom. Protect their freedoms that they have to meet together. Protect their access to your word. Protect their ability to interact with one another, to meet each other, and to be an encouragement to each other. And we pray that that you would work in a powerful way in the lives of your people. That even though all around them the country seems to be, to be falling at every corner, struggling, striving through pain and hardship, yet we pray your people would be distinctive because they have peace, because they have joy in the Lord. 
not coming from the situation that they find themselves in, not, not coming because it's easier for them in some way, but coming because they know the God who is in control. We pray especially for local believers who've been uh, saved out of Islam. Uh, and Father, we ask that you would protect them, especially as persecution perhaps increases uh, and becomes more widespread. Uh, we ask that local believers would remain firm in their faith and that they would commit themselves to the churches which they are part of. We pray that those believers would be salt and light to the communities that, and families that they've been saved out of continuing to be witnesses for you and speaking a good word about how Jesus is the answer, even to those very difficult situations that they are in. We pray for the churches, provide for them, not just financial aid, but, but uh, resources to help Christians really get to grips with your word, to understand what it is to live as believers, uh, to understand how to apply your word to the situations that they're in. We pray for men to be raised up who can lead congregations, who can be elders of churches, who can guide and shepherd your people. So Father, we pray for your church in Iraq and give them a love for the country in which they live and the people that they are surrounded with. So that your church, although small, would make a disproportionate impact to the recovery of the country. Father, we thank you that you know far more than we do about all of these situations. Uh, you know just what we need. You know just how to protect and provide and serve your people. And so this gives us confidence as we pray for situations like this, which are so distant from us. You are a good father, and you know how to give your children good gifts when we ask. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to uh, sing again now. Uh, we're going to sing Teach Me Your Way. You might have noticed in the reading from John, um, we're told that God himself uh, teaches us as his children. Well, this is, song is a prayer for God to go on teaching us by his word. talk about the issue of perseverance. We all need encouragement to persevere. The Bible warns us that no matter how strong your faith is, we all ought to take care uh, to persevere in the faith. And one of the ways that it encourages us to do that is to make sure that we are regularly meeting together so that we can be encouraged by other Christians. 
Now, of course, over the last six months, all of us have been severely limited in our ability to meet with one another, at least in the ways that the Bible patterns that for us and in the ways that we would normally be used to. And so I expect that perhaps this morning, as well as each of us needing a general encouragement to persevere, there'll be one or two who need more specific encouragement. Perhaps after these months, you feel like persevering in your faith is becoming futile, useless. What's the point in carrying on? Why why continue as a Christian when you seem to have managed so many months with very little Christian input? Is it really worth continuing as a Christian now that things are starting to pick back up again? Or perhaps for others, for you, the issue of perseverance is not that you don't want to persevere. Of course, you'd love to know that you would continue serving Christ till the end of your days. You're just not certain that you'll be able to. Are you good enough? Is your faith strong enough? Are you able to resist the temptations that come your way? Well, we're going to dive into John chapter 6 today, and we're going to look at Jesus' words. And we're going to be reminded that on this issue of perseverance whether it's the reasons to persevere, motivation, or whether it's assurance, confidence that we will persevere, the Bible always gets us to look not at ourselves and our performance and the strength of our faith and our abilities. Instead, it gets us to look at Jesus, who he is, what he has come to do, and the promises that he has given us. So whether your faith is strong today or whether you feel weak, and challenged. I hope this will be an encouragement to you to persevere in your faith and in your walk with Jesus Christ. Now, I want to dive into John chapter 6, uh, and it's first worth noticing the context that Jesus' words come in. This comes straight after the episode of the feeding of the 5,000. I'm sure most of you will know something of that miracle that Jesus performed. And the crowd was so amazed by what Jesus had been able to do that in chapter 6, verse 14, they say, right, let's make this guy our king. Perhaps he is the prophet that God had promised us so many hundreds of years before. And that means that he is now about to give us political freedom, victory, uh, joy uh, and success over all of our enemies. So they decide to try and make Jesus their king. But Jesus slips away quietly, and when the crowd eventually catch up with him, Jesus' response to them is quite stark. Verse 26, Jesus says to them effectively, look, you're looking for me for all the wrong reasons. Um, You don't really recognize who I am. You're looking for me because you want more bread, because you want economic prosperity, because you want political freedom. But, verse 27, Jesus goes on, that's not why I've come. I've come for an entirely different purpose. I've not come to fill your bellies with food that spoils, to to give a life that will eventually end and spoil. I've come to give you a far greater gift. I have come, I've been commissioned by the Father, I've been sent to give eternal life. Physical bread sustains your physical body for this life. But Jesus says, verse 35, he gets on to saying, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never thirst. It's the eternal life, which is the kind of life that Jesus has come to offer. Not just the full bellies and the economic success of this present life. Eternal life is what he's come to give. Now let's just take a moment to try and define this eternal life. You might think immediately of life that lasts forever. Life eternal. Life defined by the amount of time it lasts. But actually, especially in John's gospel, we see that eternal life isn't primarily characterised in this way. Rather, eternal life is characterized by our relationship with God. In John 17, we get to hear Jesus praying, and Jesus says, This is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. It's a life primarily characterized by that relationship. 
And because of that relationship, that leads to all sorts of other characteristics. It's a life free from the effects of sin. A life free from the darkness, the hurt, the pain, the evil that is in this world, that is even in our lives, as a result of our rejection of God. So eternal life is a certain quality of life, rather than a certain time uh, or duration of life. It's the life that we were designed for, a spiritual life, lived in communion and in, in, in relationship with God, our creator and our judge, at peace with him, loved by him, known by him, and knowing him. But in saying that it's a spiritual life, it would be wrong to assume that it's all just spiritualized and untangible, floaty, invisible, off in the air somewhere. The eternal life, though it is a spiritual reality, also has a promise of bodily resurrection. It's physical as well. And so in the verses that, Jesus, uh, in the verses that we read of Jesus' words, three times Jesus says, I will raise them up at the last day. Verse 39, this is the will of whom you sent me, that I shall lose none, but will raise them up at the last day. In other words, raise them from the dead. Give them back their physical life with real bodies. Eternal life is physical life. And he repeats that in verse 40, I will raise them up at the last day. And in verse 44, I will raise him up at the last day. It's a physical life lived for eternity, yes, in the presence of God as his children. Free from, free from the effects of sin, the darkness of this world, the hurt that it has caused, the damage that it has done. Free from all of that. And yet, because of its spiritual component, it's a life that can start today. Today, we get to have a, a taste, the, the aperitif, the starter course, as it were, of the main feast, the banquet that we are due to enjoy one day in the future. Now, we're dealing with the issue of perseverance. And of course, the first question when we're considering our perseverance in following Jesus Christ is, why? Why bother? Why carry on as a Christian? Perhaps ask yourself, why have you turned up to church this morning? Is it because you know there'd be some tough questions to answer to if you didn't turn up from your family and from your friends? Is it because you, you just enjoy church? You enjoy the, the social benefit of being with other people who are nice to you and kind to you and, and you enjoy spending time with? Or is it because perhaps you believe that Jesus will answer your prayers for maybe success or, or health or, um, or happiness in this life? Perhaps there's some goal that you have and you believe Christianity is the way to achieve that goal. What you've got to see is that Jesus has not come primarily to give us those things. They are not ultimately the reason that Jesus has been sent. Actually, all those things, as important as they are, are food that spoils. They're things that affect this life here and now, but then have no effect on into our eternity. They might make our few years here on this earth more pleasurable, easier to do, but they're not lasting. They're not eternal. And so they're not ultimately truly valuable. Not in the same way that the life that Jesus is offering is valuable. Not in the same way that this eternal life is so much more valuable than those things. When we fix our eyes on the eternal life that Jesus is offering, we find ourselves with a far more secure motivation for persevering as a Christian. After all, why continue as a Christian if it's just for the sake of having friends? You can get friends down at the library or at the gym or in the football club or, or wherever else. The church is not the only place to be part of a social circle who can support you and encourage you. It's just one example. But Jesus Christ is the only place that you can receive eternal life. Jesus Christ is the only place that you can receive the promise of 
your sins forgiven. Jesus Christ is the only place that you can receive the promise of being resurrected from the dead. Jesus Christ is the only place where you can know that one day you'll be free from all the damage and hurt that sin has done to this world. Jesus is the only place you can receive the eternal life that he is offering. And it's a life that is far more valuable than anything else that you could be chasing after in this world. So in verse 35 then, Jesus has offered himself as the bread of life. He's offered himself as the only true source of lasting satisfaction and happiness. But then in verse 36, he seems to anticipate an objection. Uh, not everybody who sees him accepts him, especially the crowd around him. They've seen him, but they've not believed him, and so they've not received this eternal life. Uh, so what does, what does that mean then for God's purpose in sending Jesus? What does that mean about uh, God's mission in sending Jesus to give this eternal life? Well, in verse 37, we see that Jesus is clearly not worried about God's plan being thwarted or defeated in any way. God's mission is not under threat. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Jesus is being given a people for himself. God has a people. That is a, a group, a, a set, set aside and they are destined to receive the life that Jesus offers. And God is giving this people to Jesus, his son. How, you might ask, how is God giving the, these people to his son? Well, Jesus receives these people when they believe. He made that clear in verse 35. Um, whoever comes to me, whoever believes in me. So it's belief that, that is the, the means by which we come to Jesus and he accepts us. So how does God achieve this belief in us? Does he do it by overriding our emotions and our wills and our thoughts, forcibly changing us into, into people that, we, that he wants us to be? Not at all. You know, the only requirement, the only requirement for coming to Jesus, for receiving this gift of life, is that we believe in him. And God achieves this belief in us, not by constraining our will in such a violent and forceful way, but by drawing us, Jesus says. Verse 44, he says this, no one, no one actually, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That is, woos him, wins him or her. And in verse 40, 45, he goes on to, to describe it in the same way. This is by being taught by God. God opening our eyes so that we, we've got the ability to turn from the sin that, that once controlled us and choose the life that Jesus is offering. He doesn't force us and shove us. He frees us and draws us and wins us. He teaches us. And this is in line with uh, verse 45. Jesus says all that the prophets have been telling you about. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel all spoke about a day when God would give his people a new heart, a new mind. He, God would pour out his own spirit upon us so that we are free from the sin that once controlled us and are able to live in obedience to him. That we're able to choose the things that he teaches us to choose. Ultimately, so that we're able to choose Jesus Christ. Now, what that means for our perseverance is that if you are a person who has faith in Jesus Christ, and I mean real biblical faith, notice the crowd, for example, recognised Jesus as someone great and good. The crowd wanted to be around him for the benefits that he might be able to give them. But not all of them really had faith in Jesus. Jesus was saying, look, you've got to recognise who I am. Recognise that I'm the one come from heaven. Recognise that I am the son of God. Recognise that I am alone the, the way that you can have your sins forgiven, the way that you can receive eternal life. If you have got this kind of biblical faith that Jesus is talking about, if you really understand who Jesus is, then it means that your faith is by nature a persevering faith. Your faith will last 
How do we know? Because your faith isn't something that you've drummed up from inside yourself. It's not simply a decision that you've made, although it is a decision you've made. It is by nature a faith that God has given you. Your faith doesn't have its origin in your decision. Your faith has its origin in the plan of God. Now, let's use an illustration to to help drive this point home. You might get, for example, an employee who is assured, confident, that he has a job for life. He works at a big company and he's certain that he's going to have this job for life. In fact, uh, part of his contract is that it is a job for life. But however confident he might be of that, it is still entirely dependent. It is dependent upon the company performance, that the company still exists for all of his working life, that they still make profit, that they still need him to do that job. And it's dependent upon his own performance, that he keeps working for them, that he keeps turning up, that he keeps doing the things they ask him to. And so he might say he has confidence, but, but it's a limited kind of confidence. Contrast that to the confidence that a child might have that his parents will continue to be his mother and father till the day that they die. They will always be his parents. Now, that confidence is an entirely different type of confidence. That, that will last, but it's not dependent on anything that he does. Instead, it's just the nature of him being born uh, by, by his mum and being fathered by his father. It comes out of his status as a child. Now, sure, his, the actions of that child might either strengthen or weaken that relationship with the parents. But his status will continue to be the same. He will continue to be a child of his parents. In the same way, our faith, if it's been given by God, will persevere. Because it doesn't come from us and it's not dependent upon our performance or the performance of any other. Instead, by its very nature, it is a gift of persevering faith. It is faith that lasts. And yes, our our lives might make that relationship we have with Jesus Christ uh, stronger or weaker. We might grow closer to him or further away. But we know that if this faith has been given, it is faith that will persevere. Our faith is a work of God, planned from before eternity, promised through the prophets for hundreds of years, made possible through the work of Christ, and finally realised in your life today as you turn from sin and trust in Jesus. But you know, the, the incredible thing is that this truth of the Father's drawing and giving a people to Jesus doesn't stand alone in these verses as the only comforting truth. There is yet another truth that is given to comfort us, encourage us, and help us to persevere in our faith. And that truth is that Jesus is not just given a people, but that Jesus is actively working to preserve his people. Have another look at verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. We've just thought about that. But now, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. You know, this verse is often taken to mean that anyone who desires to become a Christian is welcome. As though Jesus is like the bouncer at the door and and everybody who wants to come in is welcome to come in. He won't turn a single person away. Now, that is a gospel truth. Whoever wants to respond to the invitation that Christ gives is invited to and welcomed to respond. But Jesus means to say so much more. Jesus means to say that once you have arrived, you will never again be pushed out. Once you have arrived, you will never again be pushed out. Once you've been taught by God to accept Jesus, you will never again be rejected by him. It's only in this sense, really, that verse 38 and 39 make sense. God's will, verse 38, um, I've come down from heaven not to do uh, my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. 
Jesus is not doing his own will, he's doing the will of God. And this is the will of God, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me. And so for this reason, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. If Jesus is only welcoming us in at the door, in verse 37, then what is to stop us turning around and leaving again? How do we know that we will persevere? He might welcome everyone, but can he really keep everyone? Now, when Jesus says he will never drive you away, he's saying that his people will continue as his people because he keeps them. He treasures them. He protects them. He loves them. He guards them so that they will persevere in their faith right up until the very end, until the last day when they'll be raised up with him. Now, maybe you hear the remarkable stories of Christians in the church, uh, perhaps at home or abroad, through history, who have had a level of faith which allows them to endure suffering that you think you're just, you just wouldn't be able to, to endure. Perhaps you think um, you're concerned about whether you would manage to persevere if you faced those similar persecutions and those difficulties, and those hurts. Well, Jesus' words in verse 39 ought to bring you massive encouragement. He will not lose you. And just like he's able to provide grace and faith for you to endure the trials that you face today, just like he was able to provide the grace and faith for those other Christians that you look up to to, to endure their trials, so he's able, and he will, provide you the grace and faith if and when those trials eventually come in your life. You know, if you are not kept as a Christian, it's because Jesus has either been unable to keep you or disobedient to the Father's will. Which of those do you want to accuse him of? That, that your sin is so great that he's unable to keep you in his fold? That totally goes against everything that the New Testament teaches about who Jesus is and what salvation is. Do you want to accuse Jesus of being disobedient to the Father? That he decided that, that you'd be the one that, that would be okay to let go this time? Blasphemy. Jesus is neither unable nor disobedient to the Father. And so we can be confident that our faith will persevere as long as we continue to abide in Christ, remain with him. Perhaps you consider your sin to be simply too great, like you've already fallen away and that you could simply never be welcomed back. You know, it's a lie that the devil feeds you. Jesus will never drive you away. Jesus is not the one pushing you away from him because of your sin. Jesus is inviting you to return. Jesus is inviting you to repent. As your conscience stirs you because of your sin, won't you listen to that, that teaching, that guiding of God? And instead of moving further away from Jesus, move towards him. Because he alone is the place where you can find forgiveness and assurance in your faith. Or perhaps... As a believer in Christ, your faith is strong, characterised by joy, thankfulness, eager service. Then I hope this meditation on who Jesus is and what he has come to do has been a helpful reminder to you that your faith is not something that you can boast in because of yourself. It's not you who's made wise decisions and you who's chosen the better path. It's a gift from God. And your salvation doesn't rest in your performance or your ability. It rests in the work that Jesus is doing. He is the one keeping you. He is the one strengthening you. He is the one drawing you closer to him. Isn't that just simply more and more reasons to praise him? Well, let's do that now together. This is drowned and 
our service uh, with a short time of prayer. No power of hell, uh, no scheme of man can ever pluck us from his hand. Father, what an encouraging truth that we are protected, preserved by Jesus Christ, our Saviour. He lives and acts on our behalf to protect us and keep us in this faith. We pray for any who are particularly struggling in their faith right now. Father, would you encourage them with what we've been hearing this morning? And for all of us, we pray that you'd remind us not to look to ourselves to see strength and assurance in our faith, but to look to Jesus Christ, the one who died on our behalf, the one who keeps us in his care. In his name we pray. Amen.